We were spiritually dead. So what, is, what does that mean? I want to just invite you to think along with me. What does that mean? You may have seen the movie um, or the show, the, the Walking Dead. Have you guys ever seen that? Um, I, I, I've seen maybe one or two episodes of it, but I got, I got to tell you, zombies freak me out. Okay, but this this show is about the story of of what happens the months and years that f- follow a zombie apocalypse. Okay, does this sound like a good show to anybody? Okay, so I'm not I'm not recommending that show, but I'm just telling you we were like the Walking Dead. We were like the Walking. We were like spiritual zombies. Like we were walking around, but there's no heart. There's no light in our eyes. There's no light bulb that has gone on. We're we're walking around, but there's no feeling. There's no sight. There's no real hearing. We we, we could not see what God wanted us to see. Jesus described people like that in, uh, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 13. He said this, though seeing, they did not see. Though hearing... They did not hear or understand. You see, the spiritually dead, this is important for us to know, the spiritually dead cannot see. They cannot see that the kingdom of God is supremely desirable. They cannot see. The kingdom of God looks foolish. It looks mythical. It looks like something that is just completely boring and unattractive. And you know what? You and I, we were all once that way. It says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Think about this. So that they cannot see the light of the gospel... That displays the glory of Christ who is the image of God. So where does a spiritual deadness come from? Well, I think we have to go back to the book of Genesis. And we, when we find that God said to Adam and Eve, remember in the Garden of Eden, do not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day you eat it, you shall surely die. Then what happened? So Eve took a bite of the fruit, right? She gave it to her, uh, to her man, Adam, and he took a bite. And on that day, listen, they didn't physically die, but they spiritually died. They spiritually became disconnected from God. And this spiritual deadness was passed on from person to person to person to generation to generation to generation. And it has spread to every man, every woman, every child who has ever been born on the planet. And everyone here has been affected by it. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 makes it really clear for us. It says this, when Adam When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death and so spread to everyone. Here's what I want you to see first and foremost as we dive into the book of Ephesians. Number one, you were born spiritually dead. You were born spiritually dead. This is a profound Profoundly important thing to remember about yourself and about your spiritual before picture. Okay? But let's go on in Ephesians chapter 2. Picking up in verse 4, it says this, and this is so good. I'm so glad that God did not leave us there. But he had a redemption plan. He had a purpose even before the foundation of the world to save his people, to redeem his people. And we're going to learn about it here. He says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. 
man, nobody's excited about that. Okay, come on, that was a perfect place for a hand clap or an amen or something. Come on, I know it's a holiday weekend, but wake up. Come on, let's do this. There are two words that are so powerful in this scripture right here. But God. But God. These two words are overflowing with the message of the gospel. For sinners like you and me who are lost and completely unable to save ourselves from our dead set rebellion against God, there may not be two more hopeful words that we come across in the whole scripture. But God, once we were dead to any real love from God, Buried under the compounding and disorienting blindness of our own sin. But God showed up. Once we were deceived by our own lust, by our own self-determination. And we were unknowingly led by the devil and controlled by him. But God, once we lived enslaved to the passions of our flesh being driven and tossed between the, the impulsive waves of, of, our, of our fleshly desires and our minds. But God, once we were enemies of God, the Bible says, once we were, we were uh, children of his wrath, we hated him, the Bible says in Romans. But God, God has shown the gospel is, is about divine intervention. It's not about humans trying to make their way to God. It's about God, God, excuse me, God showing up and intervening in our lives when we were separated from Him by our sin on our way to hell. But God showed up with a rescue plan. And provided for us in his son, Jesus Christ. Let's continue in verse 6 in, in uh, Ephesians 2. This is so awesome. And God raised us up with Christ. And seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Wow. In order, listen, this is why he did it. In order that in the coming ages he might show the inc incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Jesus Christ. Verse 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, guess what guys, this is not of yourselves. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast. In other words, we are saved. We are redeemed only because and by the grace of our God. In other words, no one can say, I figured it out. I'm just that good. Here's the steps I took to get to God. And if you want to know how to be saved, you come and ask me because I got it figured out right here. And I'm a good person. And, and if you want to know the key to getting the, the, your ticket to heaven, come see me because I'm just that amazing. Is that true? No. No one is going to be able to boast in God's presence because God is the one who does the saving. God is the one who has initiated this redemption plan and we receive the gift. Now, if you think about all the ways in, in the world people have kind of conjured up through all civilizations and cultures ways that th they think they can be saved. Right? You think about other world religions, and I looked at them this week, and, and here's just a few of them. In Buddhism, the idea of salvation is the elimination of desire that leads to eternal bliss. Okay? And if you follow Confucius, salvation is achieved by self-reflection, self-cultivation, and living a moral life. 
If you think about Hinduism, the idea of salvation or, or the way to salvation is by eliminating all evil in your life all by yourself until you are pure enough to merge with their deity. For is, Islam... Salvation is accessed by practicing and repeating the five pillars of Islam, which are fasting, pilgrimage, giving alms, prayer, and, and pr prayer five times a day, and confessing that Muhammad is the prophet. That's the way that you get to heaven, according to Islam. In Orthodox Judaism, it's repentance. It's prayer, and it's working really hard to obey the law. In the New Age which is very popular today. and it's, it's all about gaining a new perspective where you see that, that you're connected to this divine oneness and to, this, to the universe. But probably the most common thought that I've come across about how to re get salvation is to believe that, hey, I'm a good person. I've done more good than bad. So on my own merit... I've got a pretty good chance of getting into heaven. But Paul would come along to remind each of us in Ephesians chapter 2 in verse 8. For it is by grace that we are saved. It is through faith. And this is not from ourselves. Remember, this is because of the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. So when I'm talking to people, having conversations, and they're asking me, Pastor, how can, how can I be saved? Like, I have, I have faith. I, be, I believe. Isn't faith enough? Well, I ask them this question. Can the object of your faith save you? Can the object of your faith save you? People will tell me all the time, hey, I have faith. But I ask them, what is your faith in? Who is your faith in? In. People have faith in inanimate objects. People have faith in dead saints. People have faith in beads or candles or horoscopes or Ouija boards or pendulums or, or whatever is out there. But please hear me today as, I, as I'm telling you this truth as your pastor. It is only Jesus who can save you. Jesus is the only one who can set you free. This is the plain and simple gospel that we read in the Bible. Jesus is the only one who came down from heaven. He was born of a virgin. He lived a perfect and sinless life. And he died upon that old rugged cross to pay for yours and my sins. Jesus is the only one with the power to save your soul. Amen? So it's not just about having faith. It's about the object of your faith. Who or what are you putting your trust and hope in? All these other faiths are about human achievement, about working hard, about doing this or that, trying to get to heaven. But the gospel, as I said earlier, is about divine intervention it's about that phrase but God but God showed up and he sent Jesus and so yes we were spiritually dead and we were separated from God because of our sin and we were on our way to hell but God intervened by his grace number two jot this down if you're taking notes with me salvation is a gift not a reward. Salvation is a gift of God, not a reward that you deserve. You can't work for it. You can't earn it. You can't deserve it. You simply receive it as a gift, humbly and gratefully. One of the two most powerful uh, quotes that I've ever read about the grace of God, I put them up on the screen. One of them is by A.W. A. Tozer. It says this. Grace is the good pleasure of God that inclines him to, be, to bestow benefits on the undeserving. Think about that. This is the power of the grace of God. J.I. Packer said this, Grace 
means moving God moving heaven and earth to save sinners who could not lift a finger to save themselves. This is grace. This is the power of a grace in our lives. This is not something we have to earn or work hard to do. This is the grace of God that we receive as a beautiful gift from heaven. Now, Paul's going to go a step further in this next verse and explain that we have been saved not only by grace, but for a purpose. Each of us have been saved for a purpose. And I just like to say every now and then to keep it fresh in our minds that we were made on purpose for a purpose. We were made on purpose for a purpose. Each one of us here has a divine, God-given purpose in this life. And this is what Paul's going to encourage the church here in verse 10. He says this, For we are God's handiwork. Circle that word, handiwork. We are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus. Why? To do what? Good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. I looked up that word handiwork this week, and in the Greek, it's the, it's the word poemo. It actually it, 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 it for, it helps us to know the word poem or a work of art or a, a, a masterpiece that has been created. This is what God has done in us. We are his handiwork. We are his masterpiece. In fact, in Ephesians, um, in a different version, in the Passion Translation of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, it says this, we have become his poetry. Think about that. We have become his beautiful poetry, a recreated people that will fulfill the destiny he has given each of us. For we are joined to Jesus, the anointed one. Even before we were born, God planned in advance our destiny and the good works we, should, we, we would do to fulfill it. God has saved us for a purpose. And that purpose is to do the good works that he's laid out way in advance before the foundation of the world, there are good works that God has called each of us to take, uh, take a part in. And it says this, for, but, but, but listen, our, our work for God and our, lear, our work with God, it's important to understand this truth. And this is number three. Jot this down. You work from God's approval, not for it. Okay, think about, think about that. This is, this is a powerful truth and will set many of us free. Because our position in Christ is that we are approved by God. We don't have to perform for him. We don't have to, you know, God loves us unconditionally. And we don't have to try to impress him with how good we do, how much we give, how much we pray, how much we... we no, it's good to do these things, but it's not... We don't do them because, because we, we're earning acceptance from Him. No, we do these good works because we have already been accepted by Him. This is our position in Christ. We are approved by God. This can be, honestly, one of the most uh, foreign concepts to us because here... In, in our country, we value hard work. Many of us grew up thinking you work hard and you earn it, right? You work hard, you, you work to impress somebody, you fight your way to the top. You fight, you scrap, you claw your way up. And if you don't measure up, guess what? You just live your life with a whole bunch of guilt and shame that you're just not good enough. This idea of working for God is not about working for his approval. It's not about working for his acceptance or try to earn anything or even try to pay him back for anything. Our working for God comes out of a deep well of acceptance by him. We know who we are in Christ we know that we've been chosen. We know that we've been redeemed. We've been included. We've been marked. We have, we have all of these wonderful things in Christ, and, and our position in him is secure. And now, as we work, 
we work hard. And we work with this fabulous, profound sense of joy. You guys still tracking with me? Christians are called to work. We're called to work from approval, not for it. Ashley and I have three young boys. They're 10, 8, and 6. And sometimes they'll lay around on the couch while chores need to get done. Now, as a father, if this happens, I've never thought to myself, just look at you. You're lazy, you're good for nothing, and look at all that I've done for you. Why don't you just get out of here? I'm done with you. I disown you. No, that, that's never been a thought that I've had if they're laying on the couch while things needed to get done. In fact, it would be easier for me just to ignore them and do all their chores myself, right? And not to have to parent them at all and just, I'll just take care of it. I'll do those dishes myself. I'll take the trash out myself that you were supposed to do. That would almost be easier just to do that. But, but here's the thing. As a, as a father to his sons, I know their tremendous potential. I know that they can, they, and it's my job to help them to grow up. It's my job to help them to, to mature so that they can learn to be hardworking men. So that they can learn to take initiative. They can learn to solve problems. They can learn to one day be good husbands and fathers and, and sons of God themselves. And that requires me, listen, that requires me at times to give them a push. You need a push sometimes to go in the right direction. And so when it comes to my talks with them, I can say things like this. Son, I know what you can be. I know the tremendous potential that you have from God. And I see it in you more than you can see it in yourself. Garrison, Brody, and Warner. I see it in you guys. And so I'm, I'm a father who is for you. I am not against you. And I have eyes of love that when, when I look at you, I want you to prosper. I want you to flourish in every single way. And so guess what? Here comes a little push. Right? Here comes a little push to get you moving in the right direction. And so I thought about that when I read this scripture from the Apostle Paul because God, Paul is reminding us that we all are God's masterpiece. We are his handiwork. And if God pushes us a little bit to use our gifts, if he pushes us a little bit to, to start serving or to do this or maybe to give generously in some area or just to go deeper in our relationship with him. If God gives us a little push, it's because he loves us and it's because he's shaping us. It's because he's maturing us because we have so much potential that we that God sees in us that we don't see in ourselves. And so because he has accepted us, because he has loved us, he gives us a little push from time to time. Have you ever felt the push, the gentle, loving push of God? He does it because he wants to use your life to make a difference in this world. He does it because he wants to use your gifts he wants to use what you've been through. He wants to use your generosity. He wants to use that same grace that saved you. That same grace is working in you in order to touch the lives of other people around you. That's what he wants to do. That's his plan. That's his purpose. It's not because he needs your work. Listen, it's not because he needs your, your service, your gifts, your money. God doesn't need your stuff. God doesn't need all of that stuff. But guess what? Your neighbors do. Your church does. 
Your co-workers do. Your friends and your family members do. That's why over and over and over in the Bible, we see God calling his children to good works. And it's not those good works that save us, right? We do the good works because we've been saved. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Jesus said, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your Come on, say it like you mean it. Your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. 1 Timothy 6 says this. Instruct them to do good. To be rich in in good works. To be generous and ready to share. Hebrews 10 says it this way. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and Good works. God over and over calls us to good works. And but in, even as we work, we have to remember even what the Apostle Paul explains in 1 Corinthians. He said this. This is powerful. Listen. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No. I worked harder than all of them, yet not I. Here's the key. But the grace of God that was with me. So what's Paul saying? Even the good works that I do are an act of the grace of God working in me and through me. Amen? Even the good things that I do, this is God's plan because God didn't just save us to give us a ticket to heaven and never do anything, right? No, we were saved so that the grace of God that has transformed our lives can now flow through us so that we can do the good things that God has called us to do even before we were created on this earth. To impact other people's lives. That's why it feels so good to do things like share the gospel with other people. To share a testimony of what got the greatness of God with somebody else. That's why it feels so good to use my time. To use my talents. To use my gifts to serve other people. That's why it feels so good to be generous With the church, to be generous with those who are in need. That's why it feels so good to speak words of life and words of hope and words of encouragement and empowerment to others. It's because these good works are connected to your God given purpose. And it's all because of the grace of God. So, yeah, we work hard. We serve hard, we give hard, but we work and we serve and we give from God's approval, not for it. And it's all because of the amazing grace of God. Amen. So I want to go ahead and invite the worship team up as we get ready to close this morning. We're going to, as we usually do. Uh, have a time of prayer for anyone who needs uh, prayer, whether it's related to salvation, healing, deliverance, prayer for your loved ones. We as part of our culture, as part of our belief that prayer is powerful. Prayer changes things. So at the end of the service, we like to just invite our ministry team up. And if you have a prayer need, I want to invite you to always come, come forward, be bold. And let us join with you in Jesus' name for God to minister to you, to touch your life in a powerful way. I don't know about you, but I still believe that the God that we serve is a God of miracles. He can do above and beyond, exceeding more than we can ask, think, or imagine. So it's right for his children to call upon him, believing him for big things. I believe God still heals. I believe God still sets people free. I believe God still saves souls because of his grace. 
I believe that God still opens doors of financial blessing. I believe that God still pours out his favor upon his people. I believe in the miracle working power of God. And the Bible says in Hebrews that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Meaning that he has not changed those powerful, miraculous things that he did in the past. He is still doing them today. Amen? Would you stand with me, please? So just to recap from our study from Ephesians this morning, I want you to think about this. Hide these things in your heart. We were born spiritually dead. Number two, salvation is a gift, not a reward. Number three, we work from approval, not for it. Thank God for the letter to the Ephesians church. Such profound theology. Let's enter into now a time of prayer. I want to pray for you. And then I'm going to invite you, if you have needs, you want to receive prayer about anything going on in your life, I want to invite you to do that in just a moment. But Father God, I thank you for your word this morning. Lord, we thank you together as your church, as your sons and your daughters, that salvation is a gift. It's not something we have to earn or work for, but it's a gift from your hand, Lord. And Lord, we thank you that you have called us to do good works. But we thank you, God, that we don't have to try to earn your approval because we're working hard. But we work from your approval. We work from your acceptance, God. We thank you, Lord, for your miracle working power, Father. We thank you, Lord, that you can, that nothing is too difficult with you. All things are possible with God. And we say yes and amen to that. And church, just feel like if there is someone here this morning, you've never accepted or confessed Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you've never really understood the grace of God. You've never understood that salvation is a gift from heaven. If today you would say, Pastor Brian, today is my day to give my heart to Jesus Christ. I am giving him my life, whether for the first time or I'm coming back home to him. I want to encourage you to think about that. And I want to encourage you to pray this prayer after me. In fact, I just want to encourage everyone to pray this prayer after me. This is a starting point with God out of your heart. Just pray these words. Dear Father, I come to you today as sinner. I am broken and in need of you. I come to you in need of your forgiveness. Today I'm repenting of my sin. And I'm confessing you, Jesus, as my personal Lord and Savior. Thank you for your grace. And now I put my full faith in you. I put my trust in you. I believe, God, that you sent Jesus to die on the cross, to pay for my sin. And to set me free. I give you my life, Jesus. Now fill me with your precious Holy Spirit. And empower me to live for you. I thank you today. I am your son. I am your daughter. And I have a home in heaven. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Church, let's give the Lord praise this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your grace.